So welcome to this webinar, learn more about the pre-doctoral clinical and practitioner academic fellowship. My name's Louise Hawkyard. I'm a senior program manager with the NIHR Academy, specifically responsible for looking after the PCAF scheme. I'm really pleased to be able to say that we've got Professor Janelle York with us today, who is the chair of the PCAF funding committee. Janelle, do you just want to introduce yourself quickly? Hello everyone, fantastic. We've got so many people joining us and look forward to hearing all your um, questions as we move forward. Thank you. Yes, it's definitely so good to see um, see so many of you on the webinar today. Um, I'm obviously aware we will probably will have a variety of people in terms of how much sort of consideration you've given to the PCAF before, before this webinar, but hopefully the content will be kind of interesting and relevant for, for all of you. Um, so in terms of what we're actually going to look at today, we're going to firstly cover the basics of what is the PCAF, what does it what does it include and what does it offer for you? Is it right for you? So we're going to be looking at its suitability relative to your kind of aspirations and also the eligibility criteria. We'll be looking at what and perhaps most importantly, who you need to include when developing a PCAF application. And then Janelle is going to talk about what the funding committee look for in an application. So covering some of the assessment criteria and some useful kind of hints and things to consider um, when working up an application. And then obviously, like I say, there'll be time for questions at the end of the at the end of the webinar. So firstly, what is the PCAF, the Pre-Doctoral Clinical and Practitioner Academic Fellowship? So this slide here shows a number of our kind of key programs that we offer within the NIHR Academy. And you can see there in the yellow, we've got the Integrated Clinical and Practitioner Academic Programme. Now, this is a programme for registered health and social care professionals, excluding doctors and dentists, that combines research with continued clinical practice um, and development and you can see we've got the PCAF there as the kind of first the earliest option within that program mm -hmm. so um it's important to say here I think that obviously displayed like this it does look very much like a pathway from pre-doctoral to doctoral and post-doctoral um, and whilst that's certainly an option for, for anybody that does undertake a PCAF, it's not sort of a requirement or an expectation. So if you do do a PCAF, you know, you don't need to do a DCAF to undertake your PhD. You can apply for funding elsewhere within the NIHR or with a different funder altogether. And likewise, if you don't decide to do a PCAF for any reason, if you get some other pre-doctoral funding or decide not to, to go for pre-doctoral funding at all, that doesn't stop you from applying for a DCAF either. So whilst it can form a pathway through the different levels of award, it absolutely doesn't, doesn't have to. Um, and you can be kind of flexible with how you use the academy opportunities. In terms of what the PCAF is, it's essentially a PhD preparation fellowship that's designed to take you from wherever you are now in your career, so probably at quite an early stage of your research career, maybe just getting involved with research for the first time, through to being a competitive applicant for a doctoral level fellowship application. And it does that by protecting your time to enable you to prepare a doctoral fellowship application, um, so paying your salary through the duration of the fellowship and coupling that with a personalised and bespoke programme of academic training to enable you to kind of get yourself ready for, for undertaking a PhD. Um, we do aim to be kind of as flexible as possible with the PCAF and how it's set up. We're aware that the people that might be applying for this will have a wide variety of backgrounds in terms of how much exposure they've had to research, the professions they work in, as well as all the other kind of things that make up any individual's kind of background. And as part of that flexibility, there are two versions of the PCAF available. So there's the standard PCAF and the PCAF bridge. 
the standard PCAF is a fellowship for people that um, aren't ready yet for a for a doctoral fellowship for undertaking a PhD. They might need considerably considerably more experience of research, more exposure, more training in kind of basic research methods, needing to gain that really solid research grounding um, as the kind of basis of a of a future research career. So the standard PCAP is a full time award over twelve months or there are a couple of part-time options available which extend the duration of the ward to two or two and a half years. The a standard PCAF will pay your salary costs for the time that you're undertaking the fellowship um, and will offer up to £5,000 towards master's level training and any kind of costs associated with accessing that training. So for example, travel costs, subsistence costs, that sort of thing. Alternatively, um, it is possible to apply for a full master's and to include UK master's fees um, instead of the £5,000 training and development budget. Um, that's not necessarily appropriate or the best option for everyone, um, but there are certain cases where you, know, you might feel that you do need that that really thorough grounding in, in research, if you have very limited experience to date, for example, or if you will need a master's in order to be eligible to apply for, for a doctoral fellowship, um, it might also be, that might also be an option there. There's a thousand pounds available for you to attend conferences. Um, and again, any costs associated with those conferences, so this can be for networking opportunities, but also to present um, some of your PCAF work perhaps at, at a conference or to present a poster. Um, and then there's also a thousand pounds available for what are termed research development support costs. These can be costs associated with your supervision arrangements, um, but they can also be used to undertake some preliminary PPI activity. So PPI activity is something that will form a really important part of any future PhD um, proposal, especially if you're applying for NIHR funding. Um, so having this available through the PCAF is a really good opportunity to undertake some of that kind of preliminary work um, and start working with PPI groups in your, in your local area. The PCAF bridge, on the other hand, is... Um, for people that are that much closer to being ready for, for a doctoral fellowship. So they might be have all the experience they need, have the solid grounding in research, know what they want their PhD topic to be. But what a PCAF bridge applicant would really be looking for is the dedicated time to be able to develop a doctoral level application. We're aware that you know a lot of work does go into these doctoral level applications. And so, yeah, the PCAP bridge is really there to give you give you that time to to enable you to put that work in and put together a really strong application. Um, it's a much shorter reward, and because of that different focus, it's either four days a week for six months or two days a week for twelve months. Again, it pays your salary costs for that time undertaking the fellowship, um, and it does have the same kind of budget pots available as a standard PCAP. So there's a budget for training, a budget for conferences and a budget for research development support. But in the case of the PCAF bridge, they are much smaller budget pots. So there's £400 available for training or courses. Um, and that might be for training in one specific technique or methodology that you need in order to undertake your, your planned PhD. There's £500 available for conferences and another £500 available for the research development support costs. So moving on from kind of what the PCAF offers to think about whether it might be the right option for you. The PCAF, um, as is kind of in the name, is a clinical or practitioner academic award. Um, and so it's really important that you as an individual aspire to that kind of combined career in the longer term if you're applying for a PCAF and I've already talked about how it's a PhD preparation fellowship so you do want to be planning on doing a PhD in the future um, if you're thinking about applying for the 
the PCAF. So that kind of covers, is it suitable for you? Is it kind of the right option amongst all the other options that might be out there? The flip side of that is obviously more, are you are you right for the PCAF? Are you eligible to apply? Um, so in order to apply for the PCAF and for any of the, the ICA schemes, you need to be registered with one of the ICA approved regulatory bodies. So that's any of the bodies that are listed on, on the screen at the moment. So it covers all your allied health professionals, your nurses, midwives, social workers, non-medical public health, um, healthcare scientists, pharmacists, and, and a few others. So it does cover an awful lot of the non-medical, non-dental healthcare, registered healthcare professions. You need to have at least a year's experience in, in that registered profession at the point that you apply for the PCAF. Um, and you need to be planning to continue with your professional practice or your clinical work while undertaking the fellowship. Um, so the ICA programme as a whole is very much about those combined clinical or practitioner um, careers. So you can't sort of stop working clinically in order to undertake the PCAF and then go back to clinical work um, afterwards. And within the PCAF, there's up to 20% of your time can be used to for professional practice development and for, undertake, or for undertaking clinical work. Um, if you work full time, we would expect to see that 20% option taking, taken up. If you're doing the PCAF at um, less than full time, you can still use that 20%. Um, or if it works with you and your kind of working pattern, you can undertake clinical work outside the, the fellowship in, instead. So looking now at the application process, the next round will open for applications towards the end of January and will be open for about six weeks until mid-March. At that point, the applications will be reviewed by the funding committee who will make their recommendations for funding and then the outcomes would be would be released about six weeks after the funding recommendation meeting. Start dates for the next round will be from September next year, so September 2024 through until March 2025. I think it's important to say here that, you know, for some of you on this webinar, um, you know, you might have been thinking about applying for the PCAF for a long time. You might have your kind of supervisors and your plans in place and be in a really good position to apply in, in January. And if you are, then that's that's absolutely fantastic. However, if you've kind of, if registering for this webinar was sort of the first time you've heard of the PCAF, um, then it might be that actually the round opening in sort of five weeks time isn't the best option for you. And that actually you might be better off working towards the, uh, the round opening in the following year. So in January, 2025, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily take, um, sorry, it doesn't necessarily take, um, you know, 13 months as such to develop a PCAF application, but it does take, um, you know, a reasonable amount of time to kind of make links with supervisors and get the support um, of all the people in the organisations around you that you will, that you will need. So if kind of the idea of the PCAF is very new, to you, then it's probably worth kind of taking a bit longer and not trying to trying to be ready for January, but working towards an application for the for the following round. So we're now going to look um, a little bit more closely at what we ask for in the application form, what needs to be included, and uh, who as well, because um, there's quite a few people that we will, you will need to get involved in your in your PCAF application. So in this section, we're gonna roughly follow the order of the um, of the application form. Um, there's a lot of information as well in the, um, around kind of the application form and what needs to be included in the guidance notes uh, for the PCAF. The guidance notes for the last round are available on um, our website at the moment. Um, they will include the full eligibility criteria, which covers kind of everything um, that I've talked about already, um, as well as anything else you need to be aware of, and gives full details of all the questions um, that are asked in the application form. 
So firstly, you need to have the support of a host and a partner organisation. Uh, this needs to be an English university or higher education institution and an English health or care organisation. So an organisation that provides publicly or third sector funded um, health or care services. Um, one of these organisations will need to be named as your host organisation and the other will need to be named as the partner. In previous years, it's been a requirement that the host organisation is your employer. Um, however, that's no longer the case. It's now possible for you to be employed by either the host organisation or the partner organisation. Um, and that doesn't have to be your current employer, although it certainly can be. Um, in either case, whichever organisation that you're not employed by, you would need to have an honorary contract with um, the host organisation, whichever organisation that is and whether or not they're your employer would be the organisation that we would contract with if you were successful. Um, so they need to be willing to take on that role um, of kind of managing, managing your award and receiving the funds for your award. Now you might be looking at that and thinking, well, great, but how do I get my how do I get my organization, my employer, to support me in putting in an application for the PCAF? Um, and there are kind of a number of things that you can discuss with them to try and um, you know, help them see the benefits of you undertaking a fellowship of this type. Um, so obviously your salary is paid by the fellowships, so they will have funding available to backfill your post during the fellowship. As I've already mentioned, there's 20% of it of the fellowship time available for clinical work or practice work. Um, and you obviously would be supernumerary during that, that time. Obviously you'll be developing your research expertise and your leadership skills during the PCAF, which you would obviously then take back to your department um, and kind of add those skills to, to your team. Obviously, by being seen to kind of support these kind of fellowships, it can help with staff retention and recruitment. If the organisation has staff that are interested in research careers, you know, being shown to support those ambitions can be really helpful in that regard. Lots of organisations um, now have objectives relating to research and have research strategies in place and kind of hosting these fellowships can help them achieve that as well as helping them boost their research profile. Um, and obviously, as I've already mentioned, um, you need to have both a host and a partner organisation, one of which needs to be a university. So it can help to really build and strengthen partnerships between the academic organisation and the health or care organisation that you, that you work with or in. And that might be an existing relationship or it might be a new relationship that you can kind of be a leader in in establishing and this um, kind of information for host organizations and for managers is available um, as a kind of separate document which we can share alongside the slides um, after this webinar. Um, another organization kind of that you might want to think about um, adding to your application is one of our charity partners. Um, so the NIHR offers a number of charity partnerships for its fellowships and for the next round of the PCAF we're partnering with six different charities so we've got the British Oncology Pharmacy Association, Cystic Fibrosis Trust, Kidney Research UK, Moorfields Eye Charity, Pharmacy Research UK and the Stroke Association. Um, so as you can kind of see from these some of them are looking for people working in certain professions Others are looking for people working in certain kind of health or care areas. Um, this It's an option within your application form to indicate whether you'd like to be considered for one of these charity partnerships. Um, they do sort of, it's kind of an add-on to a standard application. So there's absolutely no advantage at all, um, no disadvantage at all, sorry, in adding one of these to your application. So if you submit an application, it will be assessed in exactly the same way as all the other applications and recommended for funding in exactly the same way. 
If you were approved for funding, at that point, we would then confirm with the charity whether or not they were able to co-fund your fellowship. If they were, you would become a co-funded charity partnership fellowship. If not, you would just receive an NIHR fellowship the same way as the rest of the, the cohort. And the advantage of these fellowships is that they give you another kind of network, um, everyone else kind of funded or working with the charity. It can give you access to events, for example, or establish PPI groups that you can work with. Um, so there's a number of advantages that you might want to think about if you think that you do work in an area that, that fits with one of these charities. In terms of the kind of main content of the application, um, the first part of it would be considering your career so far, so kind of explaining to the funding committee what you've done to date. You'll be asked to provide details of any publications or research outputs that you have. Um, in it, for the PCAF, we're not necessarily expecting you to have a huge number, but if you do have them, you know, we do want to, to know about them. If there's anything kind of in your career history that you think the committee should know about, any kind of contextual factors, please do include details of them. That can be, for example, if you've had to take, had a lack of support for getting involved in research, if you were severely impacted by the COVID pandemic, for example, or if you've had periods of statutory leave um, that the committee should kind of consider when looking at your career trajectory, that can all be kind of detailed in the application form. Um, we then want to see details of your career to date, both on the research side and on the practice or the clinical side. So again, we're not necessarily expecting you to have huge amounts of research experience yet, but if you've been involved in anything of that type, so service evaluations or audits, any research experience you do have, maybe if you have already done a master's and you've done a dissertation, that sort of thing can all be described here. And then obviously your details of your clinical and your practice career and how that's progressed so far as well. And then looking forward to what you're actually going to do during your PCAP, you'll be asked to provide brief details of a research plan for a future PhD level application. Obviously, we don't expect this to be fully developed for a PCAF, especially for a standard PCAF. At that level, for that um, scheme, we'd just be looking to see kind of an idea of the topic area that you want to develop your PhD proposal in, with the idea that that would be refined over the course of the fellowship. Um, if you're applying for a PCAF bridge, we would be looking to see more of a specific idea and um, a bit more tailored that you would work up into kind of a specific research question over the course of the fellowship. You'll then obviously be asked to provide details of what you're actually going to be doing during the fellowship. So your training program, like I say, this can be a full master's if you think that's necessary. It can be master's modules, other kinds of formal training, um, placements, obviously attending conferences, undertaking PPI work, that should all be detailed in this section as well. You can also include professional development type activities. So for example, if there's a course you need or want to undertake to develop your clinical skills to the next level, you can fit that within the 20% professional development time of your PCAF as well. Moving on now to talk about the support team that you'll need around you when putting together an application. You'll be asked to name two supervisors. Your primary supervisor does need to be based at the university that will be either your host or your partner organisation. Your secondary supervisor doesn't need to be, but you should be able to explain why both people are kind of the best people to support you and how your supervision will work in practice. You also need to identify a mentor. Now, this person should have a different role to the supervisors. They should be somebody who's also following the practitioner academic kind of career pathway. And they should be more senior to you and able to kind of support you through any kind of specific, unique practitioner academic challenges that you might encounter. 
You'll be asked also to provide details of two people that can provide a reference for you, and they should be able to um, refer both to um, the research and the practice sides of your, of your career so far. As we've already talked about, you do need to continue undertaking professional practice throughout the award. And so somebody needs to be named on your application. You know, it might be a line manager, for example, to confirm that those arrangements are in place and agreed for you to continue that. And finally, you need to name both the heads of department at your host and your partner organization, and they do need to provide a statement of support for your within your application. So it's important they that they know well in advance that you're applying and that they know who you are and can develop that a really strong supporting statement for you. Finally, the money, uh, your budget um, for your application. Make sure you know what the budget caps are. We've talked about them earlier in the presentation and they're all detailed in the guidance notes and make sure that you know how that they how they translate into the, the application form itself. You will need support from your finance team, um, perhaps at both your host and your partner organisation, especially if your host isn't going to be your employer. And as part of that support, you will need to name a finance officer on your application form who, you, who will be able to access the budget um, within your application and help you develop that and make sure it's accurate. Um, so that kind of covers everything uh, I've got to say today about what the PCAP is and how the application process works and in the application form itself. So I'm going to hand over to Janelle now, who's going to talk a bit more about what the funding committee are looking for. Um, so yeah, over to you, Janelle. Thanks, Louise. Hi, everyone. So shall we move on to the next slide, please? Okay, so I mean, Louise has already given a you know really, really good summary um, on what we're looking for throughout the application. And you know it's important to remember that you know we want to support as many of you as possible um, through this career pathway. Um, so so it's really important that you pay particular attention to the guidance. There's really clear, um, some really good tips on how to complete the application form um, correctly, especially around funding, um, linking up the two different institutions, your clinical um, em employer and the, and the academic partner as well. So just make sure you pay particular attention to all of that. But really, these, these are um, awards that are about um, you, the individual, who we're wanting to be our future research leaders in the NHS um, going forward. So you really need to sell yourself. Don't be shy in these applications. Remember, we don't get the chance to, to meet you. All we have to go by is what you write in that applic application form. Um, so don't be shy. Every just try and put down everything that's tangible in relation to a PCAF award in your application um, form. But, you know, it is it is an early stage in your research and academic career. So, you know, don't don't overplay either. We'll we'll know how much, you know, if you're if you're saying you've done X, Y and Z, we do want to see the evidence for that as well. Um, but don't be shy about mentioning, Louise has already said, service evaluations that you've done, any audits. But importantly, what was your role in that? What did you learn that can support your research career or your next step in your research career? Um, and were there any outputs from, um, from, from any of that? But what was your role in all of that? How did you provide leadership? How did you provide being a champion for research and service innovation within all of that work? Um, even if you don't have those research academic outputs yet. So if you don't have any outputs at the moment, be really clear in your PCAF application as to how you will use some of that time and the work that you do for your PCAF to start getting some academic outputs, some publications, a, a systematic review, et cetera. Um, they're very competitive, these awards, and rightly so. So it's really important that you think about how you are going to be using your PCAF um, time to develop a competitive PhD 
application moving forward and you would be expected to have tangible academic research outputs when you get to that stage. So really think about how you might be able to use your PCAF research time to get some of those um, outputs, including conference presentations um, and publications. So think about your career trajectory as well. So, so you as a future NHS leader, what might that look like? Yes, it's still only early within your PCAF, but we're still looking for people who already have that vision. Is it to move into a nurse consultant post, a consultant physiotherapy post? You know, what might that look like in your organisation? And what have you already started to do in your organisation to plant those seeds so that you have a career trajectory going forward, both within the NHS and with your academic partners as well. And this is where the joint statement between the academic and um, NHS or social care um, partnership is really, really important um, that we do go in and look at those statements to make sure that they're really focusing on you, on the person that we're wanting to support, and that they're committed to supporting you through a clinical um, practitioner uh, research career. So make sure you really tell us not just about your um, research experience and the trajectory going forward with that, but also your experience as a practitioner and um, as a clinician. So what we often see is that people will really focus these applications on the research and academic side. But remember, this is about being our future leaders in the NHS and really leading that and social care and leading that evidence based practice. So what, exp what experience have you already got in your practice and in your clinical practice? But what do you need to do to help move you um, to the next step with that. So what might you need to include within your PCAF that can develop you as a practitioner or as a clinician? And what leadership experience, what practice change have you already led? Tell us about that. We want to hear about that. Next slide, please. Okay, so we've already touched on this, as, as has um, Louise, um, but really have a think about the place. Um, where you work and where you're going to be connecting um, with in, in the academic institutions and within your practice institutions as well. Now, if you work somewhere where um, the NIHR awards are quite new, maybe you're the trailblazer, maybe you're the first person, that's absolutely fine. In fact, I think that's, you know, really exciting. But what's going to be important is for you to be able to demonstrate that you've made those links with those, um, with, with those institutions who do have experience. And you may want to think about your supervisory team or your mentor who may be someone who is outside of your region or doesn't work in your practice or clinical area or even in the local university. Just really think about, you know, what's the track record, not only in your field, because some fields are much newer to these um, pathways um, compared to others. So think about who, who have been the people who have gone before you and how can you link with them? If, they, if, they, if they're not able to supervise you, well, could you use the PCAF time to maybe go and spend a couple of days with them and see how they work within their research teams or, or within their um, practice area? So don't be shy. Really have a think about what's your area of expertise What's the area of research that you're wanting to focus on moving forward? And who do you need to make those connections with? And if they're not in your immediate um, employment area, then think about how you can make contact um, with those people. And most people are delighted when, when people contact them and, um, and ask for support. Next comment, please. Okay, so training and development is a real key area for the PCAF because you are in the earliest stage of your um, clinical and, and practice academic um, career. So you really need to think about what are some of the skill sets that I need to move me into a PhD program? Do I need the full master's? 
Some people may already have an MSc in your practice area where you might have already done some um, research modules within that, and that's fine. But maybe if you're thinking you're going to be moving into a very deep qualitative PhD, maybe you might want to use, for example, the PCAF time to do, to do a particular course um, or a particular module at university around qualitative research, for example. Um, it might be an idea to, to have a look at some of the tools that are already available that help you assess your training and development needs around clinical practice, as well as around academic development as well. And if you can link um, what your needs are and therefore what you're asking um, the PCAF to, to support you with, if you can link that to something that's um, an objective uh, tool, then that can just help to demonstrate that you're really thinking quite critical about what your needs are and how we can support you with meeting those. Um, PPI has already been mentioned, and I would really encourage people to think about how you start engaging with PPI activities right at this very um, early stage. There's a number of different um, uh, online courses and other courses available that you might want to think about. You might want to start thinking about who might be um, members of the PPI group moving forward. So I would really encourage you to start thinking about that right at this early PCAF um, stage. Make sure you have a really good awareness of the budget. Um, and, and what the PCAF will and won't pay for. If you need some support with that, then, you know, ask the questions, go to your finance department um, and ask those questions um, and just make sure that you're really paying attention to that detail as to what budget will, what will be covered in the budget and what won't be covered um, in the budget. So do remember that this is a, this um, the training and development part um, of your application is it, it needs to be feasible. So just be careful that you're not spending all your time in training sessions when you also need to be spending time in practice and doing those development areas in practice, as well as um, you know developing a PhD application. And you may even want to run a pilot study, something like that, do a systematic review. Just make sure that what what you're putting in your training and development absolutely meets the needs that you've identified, but don't be over ambitious because time does go quite quickly. Next slide, please, Louise. I think I'm finished now, aren't I? Yes, I think you are. Thanks for that, Janelle. That was really useful for, for everybody, I think. Um, just to add one comment, obviously Janelle talked briefly about potentially undertaking pilot work um, or a systematic review as part of your PCAF. It's absolutely fine to use the PCAF time to do something like that, but it's important to note that the PCAF won't fund the actual kind of activity itself, any, um, any costs associated with actually doing the, the pilot work, for example, wouldn't, wouldn't be funded, but you can absolutely use the PCAF time um, to do that sort of thing. Um, this isn't particularly helpful for now so don't worry too much about it at the moment we will share the slides afterwards and um, you can follow these links then to find out more about the PCAF and if you do want to get in touch um, our contact details are on here as well we're happy to answer any questions that you have as you kind of work up your your application um, but we're going to move on to the Q&A now um, we've got about 15 minutes left so hopefully we'll be able to get through a lot of the questions that we've got but if we don't get to all of them you know do feel free to get in touch with us separately via email and we will we'll be happy to to get back to you uh, right let's see oh, okay so the first question is what's the sort of um normally the annual kind of number of pcafs so it does vary quite a lot. Um, we do get quite a lot of, of applications, but we also do fund quite a lot of them as well. We don't have a set number um, that we fund each year. It very much depends. Um, so the committee 
will make their recommendations based on what they think is fundable. Um, so they won't give any consideration to numbers. Um, in that respect, they will recommend everything that they think is fundable. And is that is then reviewed by the Department of Health and Social Care who determine how much funding we've got available and therefore how many we can, can fund. Um, we do publish each year. I think the the one for the last round should be available shortly. Um, a kind of list of how many were were funded and weren't. So you could, that will be available on our website before the launch of the next round. So you'll be able to see um, see some of the numbers there. Um, next question is: Can you give some examples of the tools? Um, so we mentioned using tools to identify gaps and needs in your training. And can you give some examples of the tools? Um, you know of that type. Um, Janelle, do you want to take yeah, that one? So, so um, the academic institutions will use a number of different, you know, there's a number of different tools um, available where you can be, you know, just high high level what you should look for when you're when you're assessing your own skill um, and knowledge needs. So there's a number available. I, I'm, I'm not going to mention any particular ones, um, but it can just help to structure. Um, this section of your application, if you if you maybe have some um, subheadings of the type of skills and knowledge um, areas that that you need, um, so so there's a, there's a number of examples you know that are available that are that are freely available um, if you did it just did a search. Yeah, just helps to structure that. structure your thinking around around it rather than sitting thinking, gosh, what do I need um, to be able to do a quantitative study. What kind of skill set do I need? It just helps to structure your thought. Yeah, it's that classic thing of sometimes you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> and sometimes you don't identify all of the gaps or the things that you might need to work on just because you're not necessarily aware of them. So the tools can be really useful in helping to kind of avoid that, that issue. Um, next question. Do PhD topics and career aims have to be NHS based or can they be about approving population health as a whole? Public health is mainly done in local or national government organisations. Yeah, absolutely. No, they don't have to be NHS based. You don't have to have an NHS or a trust um, organisation as your health or care organisation. Um, the only thing I would say here is that if you do work in public health and you are currently employed by a local authority um, or that kind of organisation. We do have a specific um, local authority fellowship programme, um, which is separate to the ICA programme and the PCAF, which might be another option for you. Um, but if, within the PCAF and within the wider ICA programme, um, public health is absolutely something that can be, you know, that can be included and that we would you know, consider for funding in the same way as any other topic. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add there, Janelle? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I probably mentioned NHS a lot because that's that's where I'm um, based. But Louise is absolutely um, right. It doesn't have to be an NHS based um, the, the facility. You just need to, to describe to describe all of that in your application. Thanks, Janelle. Um, do I need to secure a place for my intended course prior to submitting my application? Not necessarily. Obviously, we do expect people to start on their given start date. So you should have everything in place to be able to start on time. But obviously, the applications do close considerably in advance of um of you know the, the deadlines that you might have for applying for courses we just probably advise speaking to the course provider um you know having that dialogue with them about the kind of funding that you're applying for what it might look like you know in some cases it might be you know the university that you're working with as your host or your partner that provides the course in which case you can obviously have uh you know, have much more of a discussion, but if you are going to, you know, a third organisation or an external provider, it's worth having those conversations in advance, but you don't necessarily have to have the place kind of definitely secured at the point that you apply. 
Um, is the chair's report from this year available? Not quite yet, but it will be very soon. We're working on this at the moment. Um, we will aim to have it published by the time that we're able to share this recording so that um, we can send the link to that at the same time. Um, so yeah, it will be available very soon. Uh, next question. How much detail do you require regarding the area of research we are interested in, e.g. background literature or research question, etc.? Janelle, do you want to take this one? Yeah, you, we don't need the detail because the PCAP is about you developing um, your PhD programme, which should include all that detail. But obviously, we would expect people to be able to describe the area um, that they're interested in and identifying a, a research gap. But we don't expect a systematic review to have been done to identify any gap. But of course, we would expect to read an application and think, OK, so this person knows the area that they want to um, do research um, in. They've got a pretty good feel for it and, and they, they know that there's a couple of gaps, but not quite sure what the detail of that is or what they might specifically focus on within their PhD program. But we don't, we don't expect a, a research question or anything like that um, to, be, to, to be set. Nothing would be set in stone because this is about you having the time to explore in more detail the area you want to do your research in. Great, thanks, Janelle. Um, the next question is, could we expand on the comment on the last slide about being clear on the role of the practitioner academic mentor um, and I guess how that kind of differs from the supervisory roles. Are you happy to take that one as well, Janelle? Yep, yep, sure. So, so in this, this is this is in the draft feedback that we'll be posting as well. Is just to to be very clear that the mentor is someone external to your supervisory team, who who is an external person who who supports you. Um, from a pastoral perspective, um, from career advice perspective, but not not met, not um, part of the the research and clinical supervisory um, team who are guiding you through the process on a day to day basis. So if you've got someone who you you think is a really good mentor, then we would advise you that they can't um, be one of your supervisors. Yeah, thanks. It's a know. safe person to go to is the mentor. Yeah. Yes, and they would definitely be a kind of another practitioner academic, yeah. whereas your supervisors, they may be, but they wouldn't necessarily be. They might be somebody that's more, potentially could be somebody that's more purely academic and has that kind of expertise in the area that you want to work in, whereas the mentor is much more about providing that practitioner academic specific support. Um, next question, do the two supervisors and practitioner academic mentor need to be in the same profession as the applicant? No, not at all. Um, especially not the supervisors, obviously they should be the best people based on your the area that you want to work in and the expertise and the support that they can offer you. Um, obviously the practitioner academic mentor does need to be a practitioner academic and you should think about kind of the profession that you work in. So lots of the professions that can apply for the PCAF, you know, they have quite varied backgrounds in terms of how, how well established kind of research is within the profession. And so you might want to look for a, a mentor that's maybe had a similar experience to what you've had. You might want, you know, they should probably be maybe somebody from one of the other ICA professions, but it definitely doesn't have to be your own like a profession but you should think about whether their whether their kind of practitioner academic experience kind of parallels well with your with your own I would say I don't know if there's anything you want to add there Janelle no no I think I think I would agree but it's important you seek out those in your own profession especially if um if it's a profession that's quite new um, to these schemes, it's really important that you you seek out those those people and see if you can make contact. Um, with them for support yes absolutely and, but yeah we recognize that they won't necessarily be especially no. in some of the smaller professions 
sort of available enough or close enough to you kind of geographically to be your actual mentor um so your mentor might be in a different profession but like Janelle says you can absolutely make those links with other people within your professions um as well um so are there any training needs assessment tools that you'd recommend I think we've sort of answered this one in the question um that we responded to earlier we wouldn't recommend any one in particular there's none there's not one that we kind of particularly you know promote or anything like that but if you speak to you know if you start to put a supervisory team in place they'll be able to point you in kind of good directions to find to find them online um can you choose to do master's modules with a different university to the partner organization yes um absolutely um you know, we're aware that different organisations have different kind of areas of expertise and offer different courses, different modules. So there's no requirement that all of your training comes from the same organisation or from one of the organisations that's specifically named on your application. Uh, I understand that there are only two chances to apply through the PCAF. Please advise if the outcome recommendation will specifically state that the application is fundable but not successful. Uh, yes. So if for any reason, if the committee recommend more applications than we're able to fund, um, you will be informed of that in your application. We will let you know that the committee did feel your application was fundable and that won't count as one of your one of your application attempts. So, yeah, you can apply. Obviously, you apply once. If you're successful, that's great. If you if you're um, not successful on your first attempt, you can apply Again, um, if you're not successful on your second attempt, that does um, lead to a three year period of ineligibility. And the aim of that kind of three year period is that it gives you kind of sufficient time to really develop your your CV and your experience and everything to hopefully put you in a much stronger position further down the line if you do still feel that you want to apply. Um, what time are we on? I've got time for a few more questions. Uh, can we do primary research during this period? Um, so I think we talked about this. You can do some kind of preliminary um, research activities, but we don't fund any research costs through the PCAF. Um, so, yeah, you can do them. Your host organisation or would be responsible for making sure that everything was in place for you to be able to to do that but we don't fund any of the costs associated with with it other than sort of your time um right my question is do i have to be at the same trust as the one i'm applying for my pcaf or can i be developing my clinical practice in one trust and do your pcaf project through another trust um we would so you have to have a health and care and a, an academic organisation, so a university. We would generally expect you to just have one organisation where you're kind of doing your, where you're based for your PCAF or that you're working with for your PCAF and that you're doing um, some of your professional practice development. Obviously, we're aware that, um, you know, some people might have multiple contracts at the moment and there's no reason why you can't maintain those contracts with two two different organizations um but in terms of the kind of formal arrangements for your pcaf that would be with one one trust and one academic organization is there anything you'd like to add to that janelle i, I think it's what's important is that it, it is explained very very clearly in the application who your employer is, who your academic partner is, who your practice partner is, and how they're all coming together to support you through this. That's what's really important. Great. Thanks, Janelle. Um, we are expected to be early in research career, but are we expected to be early-ish in career? Is there, so is that in terms, I assume you're referring to your practice or your clinical career there Claire um we get people at all stages of their clinical or practice careers obviously you have to have had at least a year's 
experience. Um, but other than that criteria, we get people um, at all stages. You know, we're aware, especially within the ICA professions, that for some of them, you know, getting involved in research is quite a new thing. And so we do get people, you know, that are very experienced clinically that have just kind of come to come to research. Um, obviously, what we would expect to see is that, you know, we recognise that some people won't have had any opportunities to get involved with research, perhaps for, for several years in their career. But we would like to see kind of once you do start getting involved in research that that you take advantage of opportunities that come your way so that the committee can see that kind of trajectory still um, in your kind of involvement in in research. But no, there's no barrier to kind of being further through your clinical career at all. Anything you want to add there, Janelle? Yeah, and just we're, we're aware that people take career breaks for many, many um, different reasons as well. And I think for the um, professions here, it's not un uncommon for for people to to um, have breaks in their clinical or practice careers and then come back at a later stage as well. So absolutely, um, you, you've put here being older is not a barrier and abs absolutely um, not everyone has unique circumstances. Yeah, thanks, Janelle. Right, I think um, we've hit two o'clock now, so I'm afraid we won't be able to quite make it to the end of the end of the Q and A. Um, if you haven't had your questions answered, you know, do get in touch with us via email, and we can can answer them directly. Um, but yeah, thank you all for for attending the webinar today, and I hope you've all found it kind of useful and um, and valuable and. Yeah, um, myself and my NIHR Academy colleagues will be available to, to answer any questions that you do have. When we share the slides, it's got our um our contact details, both phone number and email. So please do, please do get in touch and hopefully we'll see some of you applying in, in January. Thank you. Thank you.